The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar discussing the effects of marijuana legalization on the workplace. This free webinar is available exclusively for our customers enrolled in either our Compliance Assured Subscription Service, Employer Notification Subscription, or our Compliance Management Subscription Service. I'm Leon Frierson, the Cup Publications Coordinator for Personnel Concepts, and I'm joined by my co-moderator, Karen Jonas, who serves as our Regulatory Monitoring Manager. Hello everyone. Today's speaker is David Kotler, a Florida lawyer and former Miami-Dade County prosecutor with broad legal experience during his 20 years of practice. He currently focuses his practice on the legal cannabis industry. Since 2014, he has consulted with individuals, investment funds, doctors, and employers. He has also consulted with both nationally known licensed cannabis companies and ancillary businesses operating within the cannabis space including making applications in emerging regulated markets. Mr. Kotler is a frequent, lect frequent lecturer and has been quoted or interviewed for numerous local and national news outlets, in addition to having had a monthly column in the Cannabis Industry Journal, among other writing engagements. Thank you, David, for joining us today. Thanks, Leon and Karen, for having me. Uh, I think that today's topic, featuring the effects of cannabis legalization on the workplace, has broad implications for employers. Um, even in states that don't allow for the legal use of, of marijuana or cannabis. Um, currently, a total of 29 states in the District of Columbia have now legalized marijuana for medical or adult use. Uh, and our neighbors to the north, uh, obviously in Canada and to the south in Mexico, have also recently legalized cannabis. Um, even though marijuana is still illegal in states such as Texas, employees may journey to their cannabis-friendly neighbors, you know, for instance in Nevada, and later test positive for marijuana use. Um, cannabis law is changing quickly, and positive drug tests for marijuana have increased rapidly since states like Colorado and Washington uh, legalized it for recreational use in, in 2013. So today we'll, we'll discuss the following topics. First, David will talk about prior guidance from the Department of Justice and current opinion from Attorney General Jeff Sessions on marijuana usage. We will also explore which states allow recreational marijuana, which states allow medical marijuana, and which states allow non-psychoactive medical marijuana use or industrial hemp. We will also explore the OSHA drug testing final rule issued last year and its impacts on employers. And we will discuss which states offer employee protections and delve into court cases on that subject. Lastly, we, or we will also include information on which employees should be tested and when employers should test, along with information on random drug testing. And lastly, we'll talk about employer compliance tips and what employers should do as marijuana legalization impacts more states. The format for today's webinar features a series of questions that Karen and I will be asking to David regarding the legalization of marijuana and its effect on the workplace. Before we begin, I want to invite everyone in attendance to submit any questions you may have during the presentation by using the Ask Question feature in GoToWebinar. You can also pose questions in the chat window. Most questions will be saved for the end of today's session, but those that are relevant to the subtopic being discussed will be posed where appropriate. At the end of the, of the session, you'll have an opportunity to use the Raise Hand feature in GoToWebinar to pose a question directly to our guest speaker. We recognize that marijuana legalization is a sensitive, divisive, and controversial topic for many Americans. All of our presenters today, myself included, will make every effort to avoid using any insensitive language or stating any personal opinions about the subject matter. We also respectfully ask that you use similar discretion if you are given an opportunity to pose a question to our guest speaker. With that, let's get started with today's presentation. Karen? So we know that many states have legalized cannabis use for either medical or recreational purposes, but isn't marijuana still illegal at the federal level? That's a good question, Karen, and a perfect starting point. Um, over the last several years, many states have legalized marijuana in varying degrees. Um, this trend reflects public support of the decriminalization of marijuana. However, under federal law, um, it remains that the possession, manufacture, distribution, and sale of, of cannabis or marijuana is still a crime. And it's this conflict between federal and state law that's led to confusion and challenges for, for many employers. And uh, over the last couple of years, how has the legalization of cannabis impacted employers? 
well, it, legalizations led to an increased usage by, by employees and, and in turn positive drug tests. Um, a study conducted by Quest Diagnostics reports that in oral fluid testing, uh, which, which often detects uh, recent drug use, marijuana positivity increased nearly 75% from 5.1% in 2013 to 8.9% in 2016 in the general U.S. workforce. Uh, it also increased in both urine testing and hair testing. So in states that have legalized adult use marijuana, such as Colorado and Washington, the study showed that failed tests have outpaced the national average. Positive tests increased in Colorado by 11% and Washington by 9%. Which federal laws concern the regulation of marijuana use? Uh, on some level, a number of them, but probably the most pertinent is obviously the, the Federal Controlled Substances Act, um, wherein Marijuana remains a Schedule I controlled substance and, and as such remains a barrier to research and banking uh, and uniform policies and consideration at a state level. Um, we look at guidance from the Department of Justice on approaching the legalization at state level, um, coming largely from the 2013 Cole Memo uh, from August 29, 2013, which is actually the second policy memo authored by uh, uh, Att Assistant Attorney General James Cole. Um, some would argue that, that the most recent call memo was really a polish, policy shift, and others would say it was a reaction to kind of the evolution that was happening. And under that 2013 call memo, when would the Department of Justice decide to prosecute people for marijuana use or sale? Um, the department, uh, after analysis and determination that the curtail straight uh, rights would enable the black market uh, to, to really expand, the Department of Justice came up with a number of factors to address when conditions present may be ripe for prosecution on a federal level. Um, and so the key points out of the call memo are really as follows. Preventing the distribution of marijuana to minors, preventing revenue from the sale of marijuana from going to criminal enterprises, gangs, and cartels, preventing the diversion of marijuana from states where it is legal under state law in some form to other states, preventing state authorized marijuana activity from being used as a cover or pretext for the trafficking of other illegal drugs or other illegal activity, Preventing violence and the use of firearms in the cultivation and distribution of marijuana. Uh, preventing, uh, obviously, drug driving and the exacerbation of other adverse public health consequences associated with potential marijuana use. Uh, preventing the growing of marijuana on public lands and the attendant public safety and environmental dangers posed by uh, marijuana production on public lands. And then lastly, uh, preventing marijuana possession or use on federal property. Thank you for explaining those priorities, David. Are these still in effect today? As we sit here at the moment, uh, the answer is yes. Um, the Department of Justice stated that these priorities will continue to guide uh, the department's enforcement of the Controlled Substances Act against marijuana-related uh, conduct. Um, it, it may be that things are going to change literally in the next week from the department, uh, which I may talk about a little later, but, but as we sit now, the Cole Memorandum serves as guidance to Department of Justice attorneys and law enforcement really to focus their enforcement resources and efforts, including prosecution, on uh, persons or groups whose conduct interferes with any one or the more uh, of the, the priorities which I listed, uh, regardless of state law. And if you don't mind, David, what are the differences between the 2013 Cole Memo and the previous Cole Memo and also the Ogden Memo? So the, the 2013 call memo is a shift from the Ogden memo, which is really the first one addressing uh, states' rights and, and, and how the department was going to address them uh, in 2011, and then the earlier call memo. Um, and in part, kind of shows the, the uh, evolution uh, from states such as California treating patients to, to kind of what we have now. And so the, the previous guidance really drew a distinction between the seriously ill and their caregivers on the one hand, and large-scale for-profit commercial enterprises on the other, uh, and advised that the latter continued to be, uh, meaning the big you know, for-profit commercial enterprise, uh, appropriate target for federal enforcement prosecution. And in drawing the distinction, the department relied on kind of common sense judgment that the size of marijuana operation was a reasonable proxy uh, for assessing whether marijuana trafficking implicated the federal enforcement priorities. Um, as I talked about earlier, though, uh, both the existence of a strong and effective state re regulatory system and operations uh, compliance with such a system uh, may kind of allay the threat that an operation size poses to federal enforcement interests. And so with, with the 2013 Cole Memo, it looks like assistant United States attorneys um, didn't any longer have to be tasked with looking at the size of operations as kind of the only benchmark in prosecution. 
and and to some extent uh, with the 2013 call memo, you know, opening it up for some of these larger operations, um, we, we now see what's led to multi-state license holders, um, in part backed by Wall Street money and investment funds. Have opinions on marijuana changed under the leadership of President Donald Trump? It appears, um, although we shall see. So under the, the Trump administration, um, Jeff Sessions as Attorney General has taken a less than favorable approach to marijuana. And, and we currently await a subcommittee report, which should be due out perhaps by, by the 27th. Um, and some analysis of whether uh, there's a decision to retreat from the policies under the call memo of 2013. Uh, in addition, um, General Sessions had, had written to Congress a couple months ago um, asking them not to extend the Rohrabacher Farm Amendment, uh, which is uh, the funding of the DEA uh, to interfere in legal cannabis states. And so it's been speculated that, that President Trump likely will leave decisions of medical cannabis to individual states but may pursue states which fully, uh, which have fully legalized recreational marijuana. Thanks for that very updated info, David. And if you could, what components of medical and recreational legalization should be of particular interest to our employers? I think the two uh, kind of uh, aspects that jump out at me are really that there's no obligations uh, as we sit here today under the uh, ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, to offer reasonable accommodations to use marijuana in the workplace. Um, and similarly, um, again, while I think there has been some shift, um, still in most states, employers can terminate employees for utilizing marijuana or for failing drug tests. Um, and except perhaps in Rhode Island and maybe even uh, a most recent decision, which uh, I'll discuss later. How have opinions about cannabis changed during the past decade? Um, well, Karen, despite its treatment at the federal level, uh, the medical community and perhaps hand in hand, the general populace uh, seem to be more accepting of the use of cannabis within the past 10 years as we look back. Um, numbers from the General Social Survey, a large nationwide survey conducted every two years and widely considered by, uh, by most to represent the gold standard for public opinion research, um, comport with other national surveys last year, which found support ranging from about the upper 50s to lower 60 percentile of the population. And are there certain groups that are more accepting of marijuana than others? Uh, I think so, Leon. And there seems to be significant differences between those who approve of marijuana and those who don't condone its use. Um, the general social survey indicated that two significant fault lines when it comes to uh, marijuana policy existed, and those are age and political party. Um, fully two-thirds of the respondents aged uh, 18, to 20, 30, 18 to 34 supported legalization in the survey. Um, as well as a majority of those ages 35 to 49 and 50 to 64. However, uh, seniors 65 and older stood apart with only 42% supporting legalization. Um, attitudes regarding legalization seem to have shifted pretty rapidly. Um, in 2008, for instance, I think it was uh, about only 40% of the youngest respondents and just over 21% of seniors supported marijuana legalization. Are opinions about medical marijuana changing? Sure seems so, Karen. Um, after years of opposition and challenges that have faced the industry, uh, the use of medical cannabis certainly appears you know, here to stay. Um, in a February 23, 2017 uh, Quinnipiac poll, 91% of the voters approved medical cannabis when recommended by a doctor. Uh, according to Newsweek, um, 2016, last year, was the year that the election changed uh, cannabis legalization. And a total of nine states, it's the most ever, um, held referendums on marijuana legalization, either for medical or recreational use uh, in 2016. And seven of those measures were approved. Probably the most significant initiative to pass was, was the legalization of recreational use in California, making it really the largest market in the United States. Um, while the medical community has been slow to embrace cannabis for its uh, medicinal attributes, it, it certainly seems to be just a matter of time. Um, there's now a considerable body of evidence that medical cannabis can be as good, if not better, for treating certain conditions um, that many mainstream medications uh, are currently being used for. Um, and there's, there's support from doctors with, with high profile, such as Dr. Sanjay Gupta, uh, and the reporting that he, done, he did in, uh, on CNN, which helped uh, bring attention to the plight of sick children who may benefit from, from things such as high uh, cannabidiol called CBD, uh, low tetrahydrocannabinol uh, THC products. 
So are there strains of marijuana that don't get the user, quote, high, but still offer beneficial properties to patients? Um, it, it's yes. I think the answer is certainly yes. Um, we now know that, and without being a, a plant biologist or a chemist, um, but we now know that there are many different chemicals in the cannabis plant. Uh, chemicals that cause a high, uh, like uh, tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, uh, and studies suggest that THC is effective for post-traumatic stress disorder and may reduce nausea from cancer treatments and stimulate appetite in HIV and AIDS patients and um, can help control pain with, with folks with chronic uh, pain uh, conditions or inflammation and insomnia, and may also reduce spasms and spasticity in, in patients with MS. Um, there's also another chemical uh, among many in, in the plant itself um, known as, and, and with some recent po uh, popularity, uh, cannabidiol or CBD. Um, that shows um, promise to relieve inflammation, genetic brain disorders, Parkinson's disease, Crohn's, um, ulcerative colitis, psychosis, epilepsy, uh, perhaps uh, anxiety, seizures, and spasms. And and CBD, um, in, in you know, depending on how how it is is produced, uh, does not make people high uh, or cause lethargy. And uh, in fact, can actually counteract uh, the effect of, of THC. Uh, which, which certainly makes it more appealing uh, because of the lack of the high to the patients, uh, in particular uh, older uh, patient sets and uh, the parents of, of children who suffer seizures. And is there a scientific evidence supporting the medical value of cannabis? There is. Uh, maybe not all of it yet coming out of the United States, but, but there are thousands of reports and journal articles supporting the benefits of medical marijuana. Um, according to Americans for Safe Access, there are more than 6,500 reports and journal articles from around the world that support the medical value of cannabis. There's hundreds of scholarly artist, uh, articles that have demonstrated uh, cannabis' ability to reduce pain, fight nausea, improve appetite, and these other symptoms uh, with virtually no harmful side effects. Do public health organizations endorse medical cannabis use? Um, more and more. Um, and so after you know, careful scrutiny and substantial consideration uh, of evidence over decades, there's probably dozens of public health organizations which have endorsed medical cannabis use. Um, not being comprehensive, but, but this list includes uh, ones that we've certainly heard of, like the National Association of People Living with AIDS, the AIDS Action Council, the American Public Health Association, the American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, the American Nurses Association, Federation of American Scientists, Kaiser Permanente, a, a well-known company, um, and, and uh, stalwarts such as the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the National Association for Public Health Policy, the California Medical Association, uh, Lymphoma uh, Foundation of America, and, and plenty more. Um, even the American Medical Association, which had long taken a, a supremely conservative stance on the issue, revised its policy in November of 2009 calling for an easing of federal classifications that make it extremely difficult to study the impact of medical cannabis. And overall, what is the outlook for the cannabis industry? Well, with 29 states and Washington, D.C. having uh, legalized medical or adult use uh, marijuana, the cannabis industry is booming. In 2016, it was estimated that the U.S. industry is worth more than $5 billion dollars. And by 2024, it's expected that the industry could be worth over $37 billion. David, thank you for that information on the cannabis industry. Uh, can you tell us which states allow recreational marijuana? Sure. Uh, a total of eight states now allow for the use of uh, recreational marijuana. Um, and these include uh, Alaska, uh, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington State. And uh, which states allow medical marijuana? As you can see, uh, 29 states in the District of Columbia allow for some type of medical use of marijuana. So in each state has a slightly different list of qualifying conditions for medical marijuana use, but, but most um, allow it for the use of uh, folks with cancer, uh, human immunodeficiency virus, uh, acquired immune uh, deficiency syndrome, Epilepsy and seizures um, are folks that are able to acquire cards or licenses in some places to grow or purchase cannabis for medical use in, in these states. And so let me, it's a bit of a comprehensive list, but let me kind of go through just to see if anybody listening is in these states. Uh, we certainly, we have Alaska, uh, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, District of Columbia, Florida, 
Hawaii, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Montana, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Dakota, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, Washington, and then we end with with the most recent, uh, which is West Virginia in 2017. And um, which states allow for the use of CBD marijuana with little to no THC? So those are, are really 14 states um, that allow kind of the what we call low THC, uh, high CBD strain um, with pay, for use by patients. And, and those states, and, and some of them actually allow what we call industrial hemp, maybe a topic for another day. But, but um, in any event, those states are Alabama, Georgia, Iowa, Kentucky, Mississippi, Missouri, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Virginia, and Wisconsin. Uh, and certainly each of those states has different requirements regarding the allowable levels of, of what the THC and CBD might be in, in that, uh, which is allowed in that state. Thank you for explaining the differences between the states and their marijuana legalization efforts. Could you explain OSHA's policy on drug testing? Sure. All right. So changing pace a little bit um, in regard to, to OSHA and drug testing. In, in May of 2016, uh, OSHA issued a final rule to revise its recording and reporting occupational injuries and illnesses regulation uh, in, an, in an effort to in, uh, improve tracking of workplace injuries and illnesses. And some areas that the final rule addressed uh, included uh, electronic submission of injury and illness data and employer reporting of information to their employer. Uh, and informing uh, employees of the right to work, uh, report work-related injuries and illnesses free from retaliation. Uh, and lastly, employee access to injury and illness records. And does the policy prohibit drug testing of employees after a workplace incident? No, not on its face um, in such a you know, strong statement. The new rule does not prohibit drug testing of employees following a workplace incident. But it does attempt to correct procedures for reporting work-related injuries and illnesses that may deter or discourage employees from reporting. So the rule prohibits employers from using drug testing, or the threat of drug testing is a form of retaliation against employees who report injuries or illnesses. If an employer conducts drug testing to comply with the requirements of a state or federal law or regulation, the employer's motive would not be retaliatory, and this rule wouldn't prohibit such testing. Therefore, an employer kind of has to look at each and uh, every work accident on a case-by-case -case basis before automatically testing. Um, and it's important to train those that are responsible with these kind of situations, um, you know, what are permissible for, for drug tests. What is a good example of a situation that permits drug testing? That's a good, that's a good question. I think uh, an example that's often given is when you have an employee who's driving, let's say, a forklift and strikes another employee. Um, causing both employees injury. Uh, under the new rules, um, only the forklift driver could be drug tested, while the other employee could not. Uh, the employee who was hurt but not driving arguably had no culpability in the accident, and a positive drug test you know, wouldn't have any impact on, on why the incident occurred. If the struck employee were to be tested, then that action could be considered retaliatory. Um, clearly, the driver of the forklift uh, could be tested for drugs or alcohol since the cause of the accident could have been a result of impairment due to the use of, of drugs and or alcohol. And are employees protected from being fired if they live in a state that allows medical or recreational marijuana? Well, it, it, as time goes on, it, it, it certainly the answer is, is now that it depends on the state. And so some states are silent on the issue, and, and some explicitly state that employees are not protected from being fired for testing positive, um, while others prohibit employers from discriminating against employees who are medical marijuana cardholders. Um, as an example, courts in California and Oregon, Washington, Montana, um, Colorado, and New Mexico have ruled in favor of employers who fired employees for using marijuana in violation of company policy. Um, some states have gone a step further in protecting employees who use marijuana. For example, Pennsylvania, Maine, and in part Rhode Island um, explicitly prohibit employers from discriminating against employees because of their status as medical marijuana cardholders. Uh, in New Jersey, employers need not accommodate marijuana use in the workplace, but the law is silent on off-duty use. And then we have states such as Arizona, Delaware, Minnesota, and New York, where uh, the burden's been placed on the employer to prove that the employee tested positive, uh, not only, but was also impaired at work. 
David, uh, can you talk about some of these court decisions ruling in, in favor of employers? Sure, I can, Karen. It's, it's, I guess, the fun stuff for lawyers, but hopefully we don't put the rest, uh, rest of the, the audience to sleep. Um, let, me, let me address first uh, the 2015 case, uh, Washington State and Swall versus Safeway, Inc., um, which where, where the court came to the conclusion that an employer may lawfully terminate an employee for using medical marijuana, despite the employee's defenses they had a valid prescription uh, and used the marijuana when it was off duty. The takeaway from that case showed that Washington medical marijuana users were not protected classes and thus couldn't argue uh, disparate treatment. Um, kind of taking a little bit of a sample, um, you also had the case of, of Roe versus Teletech, uh, customer care management, and Washington, and the court there concluded that a private employer may rescind a conditional offer of employment based on a prospective employee's failing of a drug test, despite being an authorized medical marijuana user. And this showed that, that Washington's medical marijuana law did not require accommodation or protect an applicant or employee from adverse consequences under an employer's drug policy. Um, look at a Colorado case, uh, the, the Coates versus Dish Network case, um, which upheld a decision of a lower court finding that an employer of Dish Network LLC lawfully terminated, uh, terminated an employee based on a violation of the drug uh, policy of the company after the employee tested positive for THC during a random drug test, even though the employee was a registered medical marijuana patient and did not use medical marijuana during work. Um, under Colorado law, it was uh, considered discriminatory for an employer to terminate the employment of an, any employee due to that employee's engaging in any lawful activity off, off the premises of the employer during networking hours or, or non-working hours. But, but despite that, um, the Coates uh, decision found it, it found basing another law. Um, interestingly enough, I think we see a bit of a trend, just as we see a trend in, in public opinion and, and perhaps opening up on the medical side, we see a trend in the case law. And so I want to talk about two recent cases um, that seem to be shifting a little bit. Um, one is a Rhode Island case that was decided in May of this year, which was Callahan versus Darlington Fabrics and the Moore Company. Uh, so the Rhode Island uh, Superior Court uh, had ruled an employer is prohibited from re refusing to hire a prospective employee because the employee would potentially fail a pre-employment drug test due to the employee's use of medical marijuana. The court held that uh, that state's Hawkins Slater Medical Marijuana Act, um, which prohibited discrimination against medical, medical marijuana users, also protects uh, the cardholder's actual use of marijuana. And so even though using marijuana is still illegal under federal law, the court held that employers that refuse to hire card-carrying prospective employees due to their use of medical marijuana may be subject to liability under, under that state's Medical Marijuana Act. Um, the court also, in that case, addressed and did not find a federal preemption issue under belief that the Controlled Substance Act and issues in, this, in that case could coexist. And, uh, and then rather, you know, rather timely um, is a case earlier, literally uh, from this week um, or thereabout, which is the Christina Barbudo versus Advantage Sales and Marketing LLC. And in that case, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court um, ruled in favor of an employee who was fired after testing positive for marijuana. Um, the employee was terminated after one day uh, on the job when her drug test came back positive. Uh, she had alerted her supervisor that she was legally prescribed or recommended marijuana to treat symptoms of her Crohn's disease prior to the test and was told wouldn't be a problem. However, based on the drug test, the employer still terminated her, stating that they followed federal law and not state law when it came to marijuana in the workplace. Um, the employee filed a suit in uh, Suffolk County Superior Court accusing the company of discrimination and was given uh, the okay to proceed by the highest court uh, this past Monday. So um, in Massachusetts, that type of case is being allowed to move forward. I, I guess we could see what happens in the merits, but that's, that's a pretty strong indication of, of the way things are going. And so this ruling demonstrates a new level of worker-related protection under state medical marijuana laws. Well, thanks for exploring those cases with us, David. Uh, we did get a request for a California case from Mark as well. So if you have anything in mind for our question and answer uh, portion of the presentation, that would be great. Uh, but moving forward, what are some considerations for employers should make uh, when, regarding drug-free workplaces in light of all these changes in marijuana law? In this changing regulatory climate surrounding the use and legalization of marijuana, it's, it's more important than ever that, that employers are diligent about their drug-free workplace policies and procedures. 
um, where you have anti-drug policies that exist, it's impertinent that, that employers make them more state-specific than ever, um, as demonstrated uh, by the cases. Do you have any specific recommendations for employers? I do. Um, I, look, I mean, first of all, I think probably the safest thing for employers to do um, for the time being is, is maintain zero tolerance drug policy until, until we really review state level policies. Um, and the policy should articulate zero tolerance for use of drugs and abuse of alcohol um, or other illegal behavior. Um, the policy may also allow for discharge or discipline of an employee um, or refusal to hire an applicant um, if an employee or applicant refuses to submit to a drug test. Um, now, again, it's got to be state specific as we see how that's kind of shaping up in, in really recent cases, but uh, make sure to require employees to acknowledge the drug policy you have in writing. Um, documentation, as a litigator, I, I, I've really come to learn this, that documentation is always critical um, if taking an adverse employment action. Um, you should also ensure your HR departments um, or they're similar, whoever has a similar role is aware of what steps should be taken to document violations of company policies, and if necessary, um, and, and maybe advisable, utilize uh, progressive discipline. And how about drug testing recommendations? Should these also differ by state? I, I'd say that depends, and I'd also say absolutely. And so, you know, some states have uh, enacted specific drug testing statutes. Um, and some of the laws restrict testing and require specific procedures to be followed, uh, may restrict sanctions that can be imposed on employees who violate policies, and authorize private lawsuits against employers, labs, and medical facilities that violate those laws. It's really imperative that employers determine what laws uh, exist, if any, in, in their state in which they conduct business and ensure compliance with those particular laws. Um, if employers decide to drug test employees for a variety of reasons, and, and so um, such as deterring, detecting drug use, as well as providing concrete evidence for intervention, um, and even at times referral to treatment and disciplinary action. What are some questions employers should consider if they choose to include a drug testing policy? <clears throat> I think I, I can probably summarize a few. Um, and so, so employers who decide that their policy um, will include testing should probably ask the following questions. Let's see if we can come up with with a good list. So I guess first and foremost, it's, it's who will be tested. Um, options may include, you know, all staff, job applicants, and their employees in uh, safety-sensitive positions. Probably most important to remember that drug testing policies should be consistent in order to mitigate uh, any possible discrimination. Um, so maybe it's applied to all employees. Um, next question, one that really comes up is when will tests be conducted? And these possibilities include pre-employment, upon reasonable suspicion um, or, or for cause, perhaps post-accident, uh, keeping in mind the new OSHA rule, uh, randomly, periodically, and post-rehab. Um, most employers choose to test at the beginning of employment, which is fine. Uh, once employed, however, employers should consider what should trigger a test, uh, and that may depend on the type of work or the industry. Uh, from a risk management perspective, really employers need to be more proactive in certain areas, I think. For instance, uh, driving, uh, warehouses, dangerous settings, or instrumentalities. The most important thing is to be consistent and, and follow your own policies and procedures. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, next would probably be which drugs will be tested for. Now, options for this include testing applicants and employees for illegal drugs and testing employees for a broader range of substances, including alcohol and certain prescription drugs. Um, tests for marijuana, interestingly enough, do not always indicate current impairment since marijuana can stay in an individual system for weeks. So an employee's off-duty medical marijuana use can lead them to fail uh, an employer's drug test. And that's now really something to think about, is, especially since people are now going to recreational states and may use on a weekend and then come back and be fine for work, but, but may show a positive. Um, how will tests be conducted is another area to consider. And, and so there's certainly different testing modes uh, available and many states have laws that dictate which may and may not be used. Um, one last question that, that comes to mind is, okay, now you've tested positive, and, and so what are the consequences of a positive test? Uh, for pre-employment testing, a positive test may result in the rescinding of the employment offer. For existing employees, it may lead to counseling or some sort of um, uh, you know, uh, principle and guidance or even, even termination. 
Um, some states offer protection to medical marijuana users by requiring employers to prove evidence of impairment in addition to the positive test, and that must be kept in mind. Thank you for explaining those scenarios, David. And should employers perform random drug tests in light of the recent OSHA guidance? I think the decision to perform random drug tests really depends on, for me at least, on what industry the employer may be in. Um, and sometimes there's a greater need. You know, most employers can find random tests to employees occupying positions of safety or security sensitivity. Uh, employers who choose to perform random tests just need to make sure they have a clear policy on how the tests are administered and the parameters of the test. I guess my, my last point on random drug testing kind of may sum up this presentation on some level. Um, when making a determination on random drug testing, ask yourself, what would you want the culture of your company to be? Look, I'm not suggesting that, that you know, there's a bong getting passed around the lunchroom, but what I'm suggesting though is, is a commitment to make your workforce feel comfortable in your setting, um, where they can be inspired to be part of what it is that you do. Um, use this as an opportunity to perhaps address changing social norms while taking the opportunity to update your policies. Thanks for your time today, David. Do you have any last tips for employers? I do have some final recommendations. Um, my, my first tip would be to identify and analyze your current policies and procedures relating to medical or, or adult use recreational use of cannabis. Um, you may have multiple policies and procedures relating to such drug use. Make sure to be proactive in identifying issues and remedying them. If a law is forthcoming in your jurisdiction, don't necessarily wait until it's passed. Um, do the due diligence in advance. I'd also recommend that you educate all employees on changes. Um, be sure, actually, to educate your supervisors and managers in separate training, I'd recommend. Uh, you may also want to consider enlisting assistance on issues related to cannabis from attorneys or consultants that have done work related to, to these issues. Um, this may not be your normal labor law person. Um, it may be, but, but, but that's something to consider. And finally, there may very well be variation on a state-by-state -state basis as time goes by. Um, pay attention to whomever you are working with, whether it's it's a consultant or, or cannabis attorney or, or your labor law attorney, um, that they're that they're up to date on on state level issues. As we see, there's really uh, quite a difference across the board. Thank you, David, for reviewing this information with us. Before we end today's session, let's take a moment to answer some questions from our audience that were submitted during the presentation. Leon will ask the questions on behalf of our attendees. Hello, audience. Um, thanks again for your participation and engagement in today's presentation. We did receive a number of questions and we'll do our best to get through all of them. Um, um, I have one directly related to the example that, that, that you spoke of, David, uh, with the forklift and obviously the driver being tested. Um, Kevin kind of comments and he also has a question. Of course, the employee walking that was hit by the forklift could be drug tested along with the forklift driver if it was determined that the employee committed an unsafe act by walking outside designated walking paths that the employee was trained to stay within. Is he correct in that assumption? Not, not, not candidly, not on its face. I mean, uh, you know, walking outside the line may not necessarily um, implement some type of, of impairment of one's faculties by a, by a drug or alcohol. And so I think for me, it gets back to kind of a policy and training of, of supervisors on, on what needs to be documented that's more sufficient. And what I mean by that is in and of itself, walking out the line probably for me doesn't justify any level of impairment that would suggest, hey, we're doing a drug test. Um, probably no different than actually the interaction between a, a DUI officer, a police officer, and a DUI driver. And so just as an example, pulling from kind of, you know, my background, um, in, in a situation where an officer approaches a person they believe to, you know, be impaired by a substance, they document as much as they can beyond just normal activity. For instance, smells, um, actions, um, bloodshot eyes, flushed face. Um, slurred speech. And so, candidly, I'm not sure I see it any different in the workplace. Um, in that example, just walking out the lines, I might tell you probably not good enough. Um, I'd want to see some documentation showing something else to, to suggest impairment by a foreign substance that would then um, allow for or suggest that that drug testing post-incident should take place. 
Excuse me. And then somewhat related, uh, Mark asked, and I we may have kind of reviewed this. We drug test at fault auto equipment accidents, um, either auto or equipment. Um, it is, is it illegal to test those who are not at fault? It seems like, and, and I, I guess it dovetails to my previous answer. I don't know if I want to use the word illegal because I, candidly, I'm not sure the OSHA mechanism for, for that type of you know, reporting, but my uh, A, it probably is going to address uh, uh, fall some, somewhat on state law where you're located, number one. Number two, goes back to if properly documented with post the OSHA rule, new OSHA rule, with some indication of something on board, um, then the answer is no. I think the problem gets back to testing everybody involved is going to be problematic post uh, the new OSHA rule, in my opinion, um, without some articulation of, of um, something more in the non-at-fault person um, going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And then uh, Kevin and Mark have a number of questions somewhat specific to their work. Um, so we'll make sure that we do submit those and uh, we'll get as many as we can, but if not, uh, hopefully you'll be able to answer to those uh, after the presentation. So just switching it up a little bit is um, Charles asked, is there a study or information results as to the effectiveness of medical marijuana versus lawfully prescribed opioids? Hmm. More, well, so, so none that I can think of off the top of my head. The, the, you know, the problem is since marijuana is a federally controlled substance, you don't have a lot of peer review clinical trials um, taking place. And so what, what you see is either information coming from out of, out of country, from places such as Israel and, and Germany um, and the United Kingdom um, to some extent. Um, and, but you do have anecdotal. Um, and I, I have seen um, some patient populations that have been looked at. Anecdotally, it seems that there are, uh, there may even be some programs who are seeking to wean um, individuals off of, of opiates uh, utilizing cannabis. I can't point to a specific study, but it's certainly known to be kind of within the space as, as a um, potential method to do that, um, that I'm aware of. Okay, and um, <clears throat> kind of a state, state uh, by state type question: How or can an employer reprimand an employee that lives in a legal marijuana state, whether recreational or medical, uh, but the employer is in an illegal marijuana state? I wonder if if uh, if that employer isn't having to do state specific you know, inserts into their policy and procedure manual or in the employee manual. Um, I guess it's easy to take a company-wide approach, but, but uh, for instance, I have a company I work with that, that has, you know, it's, it's home in, in Miami, let's say, and, but has satellite offices in, in Kentucky and uh, in Indiana and, and not necessarily specific to marijuana, but, but because of the different laws on some of the issues that uh, are addressed within the employee manual, there's, there's state-specific inserts. Um, I think to some extent, you know, companies are now forced to, to go through that analysis. Um, and, and if you took a, a no tolerance approach, um, the truth is you may, if you're in a state, i.e., you know, Massachusetts and now Rhode Island or vice versa, um, you, you may be uh, setting yourself up for a lawsuit. And so I think now is the time to dig down. And to go from, you know, nationally recognized uh, or na nationally, you know, themed uh, employee guidelines to on this issue, um, go state level specific and, and craft it specific to that state. Thanks again, David. And uh, Veronica asked if a, if a new hire tests positive on their physical, but is willing to provide medical documentation for them being on medical marijuana, should they still hire them or if they were to turn them away, would it be legal to do so? So two-parter. Um, in terms of of hiring, I think you know you get to you get to kind of look at your culture. Um, the truth is, if you're comfortable hiring somebody who has to take a strong prescription medication, um, it, it may be that that 
you should have no problem um, hiring somebody who who is capable of taking cannabis as a medicine uh, pursuant to recommendations, especially in some of the more regulated states, which really have doctors controlling controlling this. Um, I, I think as long as there's an assurance it's not affecting their job performance, which which frankly, um, you know, I don't know that we see a lot of effect on drug performance, and you know, it's not what it used to be. I don't I don't think that these employees are. Um, they may not be actively using. They may be microdosing, and 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 frankly, they could be on on you know low THC strains um, that control certain uh, items. So I don't I don't know that I I you know personally may not have as much of an issue. It takes probably a little bit uh, more more vetting on the front end. Um, but at the end of the day, you may have an employee that performs and functions better than 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 half your employees that may be on some legally prescribed substance. Quite frankly. Um, I, I think the second case is um, I don't mean to keep banging back to to you know state level specific, but but that we can see from the variance in the case law that I went through that that really is a state level topic, and uh, and we know you know based on some of the states giving the protections um, more so than others that that depending on where you are, uh, I think you you know it's, it's probably a good idea to spend a little money on the front end. And save yourself a lot of money on the back end looking at these issues. And um, I have somewhat similar questions from Veronica, Lena, and Lauren, um, all talking about specific industries. Lauren asked about construction and if they feel like it's a, a safety hazard for someone on medical or recreational marijuana. Lena speaks to uh, pro prohibiting employees from driving vehicles um, if they did have medical or re recreational marijuana and Ver Veronica speaks specifically to a manufacturing company. So if you could, can you just discuss like if there are any exemptions for specific industries and how they might go about um, doing that without being discriminatory? Yeah, I think I think Brightline, because of those types of industries that, that seem to be um, you know, a little more sensitive to, to use, I think a bright line policy is probably more acceptable and you're giving a, a wider latitude. And I think the real big issue is, is probably no different in alcohol on some level, which is it, now in places, you know, it's not illegal to, to possess and or use cannabis. And, and the question then is, well, it may be against policy to use it and be impaired by it in the workplace. Um, the problem with, with marijuana is it can be in your system in a drug test and have absolutely no effect, absolutely no effect on your ability to complete your job. And that's kind of the, the, you know, the issue that, that I think everybody is grappling with. It's a little different than, than alcohol, which expels from your body at, you know, 0.5% or whatever it is, a beer an hour. And, and, and it, whereas, whereas somebody could probably use cannabis on a, on a Friday night, but, uh, but go to work um, at Saturday morning and have no ill effect from it. Um, but yet it's still on board in a drug test. I, I think some of the benefit to employers in this area is is more likely than not going to come with um, advancements in the testing that's taking place. And so it may be that there are soon available um, reliable um, testing methods um, in terms of, of breath testing uh, and other testing methods, which will, will show um, not just uh, cannabis uh, on board, but but the level of impairment at the time, and and that may you may have to go literally to that level to to support testing and and um, you know what one might be doing with an employee that tests positive. Thanks, David, and I hope that also answers your question, Joseph. He was asking about uh, the levels of intoxic uh, intoxication. So um, if not, we'll be sure to respond via email. I do have one last question before. Uh, we end the presentation today. Um, two questions I'll kind of join together and speaks to the future of recreational and approved marijuana usage. Do you think President Trump will change a policy on the recreational marijuana? And um, also, do you think more states will approve the use of recreational marijuana? If you could just speak to the future of where you see the industry going. Sure. So I you know, it, the federal government's such a, a, a you know conundrum right now. I, I, I think Trump probably would have been inclined to to go. I don't want to get into politics, but but 
you know, state rights uh, type of approach um, from a philosophical approach. Um, and but you have an attorney general who is is almost morally opposed to the use of cannabis and, and has pursued uh, an agenda of, of kind of drug policy that takes us back a number of years, um, right or wrong, depending on, on what you believe. And so I think we have the risk of, of general sessions driving drug policy um, versus agencies and or president who maybe should better or Congress. I mean, Congress could put an end to this debate, but but I think with literally within the next week, we'll know what direction Jeff Sessions, General Sessions, um, is going to take based on this committee report um, that's going to be coming out. And so I think the real issue is how, what, you know, if they do try to crack down, you have a number of states that have basically are going to potentially say pound sand. And so you know, we, we've always thought the big the big battle between the states and the federal government would come on on maybe social issues such as as you know um, uh, civil rights or or you know back in the day when when they wanted to change the uh, the the national drinking age and it was tied to highway funding and so now it, on some level I wonder if the the big you know fight between state rights and the federal government overreaching and preemption et cetera is is really coming down to to, you know, marijuana. Um, and it seems to be a possibility. Um, and I think, I think there's so much money now tied into it and economies that are dependent on it. I mean, you look at places like Colorado, literally, you know, funding schools and, and you know, housing prices and the redevelopment of Denver downtown. And it's tough to pull back, especially when places like California, one of the largest markets, I mean, literally has, has economies dependent upon it. it's turned around cities and towns. And so, I think it's going to be difficult um, to, to enforce and, and could really lead to, to um, you know, the biggest challenge that, that we've seen. Um, barring that, yes, I think that, that um, markets will, more and more markets will uh, go to adult use. Um, number one, it seems to be just a natural progression as, as places mature. Um, number two, I think that, that cities, towns, uh, counties and states see the economic benefit and what it's bringing into into their local uh, communities, um, and and I think as as um, social norms and policies continue to evolve, um, I think more more people, especially as the older generation um, you know passes away, um, I, I think we're going to see a real shift and a continuum of maturity of markets towards adult use, um, unless unless you know, there because of use, we start seeing um, you know real negative things happening. Um, so far, people aren't dying from cannabis use, and and I don't think there's any uh, supportable statistics showing increase in, in drug driving arrests or fatalities, um, and and we don't see you know some of the other negative impacts. But but with time, it's possible that that happens, and that could be for me probably a reason that you may see some pullback. Um, but barring that, it seems that that as markets mature. Um, they move to adult use. That's what just that's what happens. Excellent. Thanks for the, those in-depth answers, David. We really appreciate it. I do want to acknowledge that we have continued to get questions, uh, great questions specifically from Megan and Keith that are still filtering in, but unfortunately we have run out of time. So all unanswered questions will be forwarded to David via email and his responses will be sent to all attendees in the coming days. I want to thank everyone who submitted questions about today's topic and thanks to David for taking time to answer them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Karen? This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending today's presentation. We hope you found this information useful in understanding the legalization of marijuana and its effects on the workplace. Thanks again to David for being our guest panelist. We look forward to continuing to work with David on future presentations. And to all of our attendees, thanks for choosing Personnel Concepts as your provider of workplace compliance solutions. Have a good afternoon, everyone.